everyone and welcome back to the ninth video for the basic Bible study course. In this section we're going to introduce the three major types of communication that you'll find in the Bible and then we'll look in detail at the first of these three and how to read it well. So let's start by defining the three major types of communication in the Bible. These are the general ways that the scripture communicates. These are the big picture categories that can best be explained by, by just describing them. The first category is called discourse. Now, this is a fancy name for straightforward telling of facts and ideas. It is direct teaching, explanation, and elaboration of truths that the author wants the reader to know and to understand. It's the telling of facts and information, giving commands, encouragements, instruction, and even rebuke, and these are often supported by things like giving reasons and purposes and inferences, etc. In other words, discourse is a straightforward telling and explaining of ideas. And we see discourse in the Bible in places such as the Epistles, the Sermon on the Mount, the Preaching of the Apostles, the Ten Commandments, among others. Then the second category is called narrative. Now, narrative is the telling of a story. It is relating history, describing what happened. But in the Bible, narratives tell the story in order to teach, sometimes to teach moral lessons, to give instruction from the example of what happened in the story. In other words, the stories in the Bible are not told just to tell the story. They have a purpose why they are told. And the purpose is usually to demonstrate who God is and what he is up to. Now, of course, narratives tell us about the people and the events that they describe. But in the Bible, they primarily tell us about God's plan and his work in the world. Now, we see narratives in the Bible in places like the Gospels, the Acts, and all the Old Testament history. Then the third category is poetry. Now, the content of poetry overlaps with discourse in that it often communicates information and ideas. But the major difference is that in poetry, it is the way that it communicates it. See, poetry communicates in emotive, stylized language, using the form of speech to highlight the content of the speech. Poetry attempts to say it in a memorable way. So it's not just what is said, but also the way that it is said. And part of what is communicated is communicated by the way that it is communicated. Now we see poetry in the Bible in places like the Psalms, the wisdom literature, and many of the prophets. Now I need to make a point about how these three types of communication are different from genres that we talked about in a previous section. Please do not confuse the two. These three types are, are a larger category that, that's kind of an umbrella over all of the genres. There are only three types, but there are many genres. But at the same time, the three types are typically seen within the genres. In other words, all of the genres are made up of one or more of these three types of communication. Let me explain this with a couple of examples. For instance, the Gospels are a genre of biblical writing. And in each of the Gospels, you'll find a lot of narrative in the telling of the story, but you'll also find discourse in the teaching sections where Jesus speaks and teaches. And in some cases, you'll find poetic passages in the middle of a Gospel. In the same way, the Old Testament prophetic books are a particular genre, and they're largely made up of poetry. But mixed in the middle of this prophetic genre, you will also find narrative passages and some discourse passages. 
So genre is not the same as these three types. There are overlapping categories. Now, at the same time, some genres are primarily characterized by one of the three types. The Old Testament history genre is obviously primarily narrative. The epistles are primarily discourse. And the Psalms are primarily poetry, even though all of these may contain other types as well. So it's important to keep these two concepts separate. Now, for the rest of this section, we're going to concentrate only on discourse. And we'll come back to the other two types in future sections. Let's start with defining the characteristics of discourse in more detail. And I'm going to begin this description of discourse by showing you some vacation photos that I took of my, at my parents' house when I visited them a while back. Now, this first picture looks like a rock, and that's because it is a rock. This is one single rock, and I'm using it to represent one single idea or truth. Now, it may be made up of many smaller particles, but it's one unified entity. Just like one idea may be made up of many words, but still just communicates one idea. Then the second, second picture, it's actually of the same rock, but it's zoomed out to show its context. And in this picture, we see that our rock is one of many rocks that are built together. Notice that different sized and shaped rocks are formed together in a purposeful pattern. They're intentionally, intelligently formed together. And also notice that the mortar that is used to glue them together is as much a part of the structure as the rocks themselves. So it's not just the rocks, but the relationship of the rocks and the mortar and how they are built together. And the structure of multiple rocks represents ideas working together. And then this third picture is still the same group of rocks zoomed out further so that we can now see that they are actually built into a fireplace. Notice that they are all intentionally fit together for an overall purpose of being a fireplace. This is done according to a, a conscious plan and they are logically arranged best how to meet this purpose. Every rock and all the mortar and all the other materials play their part and have their function in light of the whole. And the whole is purposely built to have a function of being a fireplace. These are not just random rocks that somehow fell here. They're intentionally placed according to a plan to serve a purpose. And notice from these other pictures that similar rocks could be similarly connected together for a completely different purpose. Now, so all of this is to get to my definition of discourse. It is, discourse is ideas working together for a purpose. Just like the individual rocks work together with one another, and this working together is for the purpose of being a fireplace or a wall, so in a discourse, the author uses individual ideas, but then they are intentionally put together with one another, with other complementary ideas, and these ideas are arranged together for a purpose, to accomplish something. Let's break down these three things. First, discourse is communicating ideas. Ideas uh, are techni technically called propositions. A proposition is one self-contained truth. A proposition is not necessarily the same as a sentence. For instance, I could say, go to the store and buy some bread. That's actually one sentence, but it contains two commands, to go and to buy. That is, it contains two different propositions in one sentence. I could say, go to the store because it's almost dinner time. This one sentence contains one command and one reason. That is, two different propositions. So to think of this, how one proposition is usually one verb, one verb per proposition. That is, every proposition contains one action, one statement, one command, etc. Now, part of reading discourse well is to recognize each idea being communicated and to see it on its own. But discourse is ideas 
but ideas working together. The relationship between the propositions is, is extremely important. Remember, local literary context. Words get their meaning in sentences, and sentences get their meaning in paragraphs, and paragraphs get their meaning in larger discourses. Context, context, context. Trying to understand the idea without seeing how the ideas work together is like trying to guess the purpose for the rock from the first picture alone without seeing that it's part of a fireplace. When you see a discourse as a whole and see how the sections are related, how the paragraphs, sentences, and words are all related together, then you really know the discourse in a way that would be impossible without paying careful attention to the context. When you, when you pay attention to the context and how the ideas fit together, then you hear from God better than you otherwise would have. So discourse is organized, it's an organized connection and flow of ideas. It's organized, it's logical language developing related truths, not just unrelated truths somehow thrown together. It communicates ideas by communicating the progression and relationship of ideas. It groups ideas together into a coherent flow of thought. Now, this is true of individual paragraphs, but is also true of larger discourse structures as well. For example, have you noticed the, the book of Ephesians and the book of Romans, they both have a, a clear two-part general outline. The first portion of each of these books tells the truth of what God has done in Jesus. And then the second portion of each of these two books then makes application of this truth to the lives of the readers and the way they should live in response. Now, finally, discourses, ideas working together for a purpose. So we should always ask, what is the author trying to accomplish? And this is often related to the historical context and occasion of the book or the passage. But also watch for commands, as they're usually the key to understanding the, the purpose of the discourse. What does the author command the reader to do? What are they told to think and believe, or, or what not to think and believe? What are they told to do, or, or what not to do? And notice how the author connects these commands with the reasons, with the motivations, with the purposes for why and how they should carry out the commands. How are the ideas related together to accomplish this purpose? Now, by, by paying attention to this, you'll notice the purpose for the discourse and the author's application that the divine and the human authors intended in the life of the readers that includes you and I. Okay, so that is the nature of the discourse in the Bible. It is ideas working together for a purpose. So now let's look briefly at some of the tools we can use to read and understand discourse well. Now, as you might guess, the major tool for reading discourse is the literary context Context, context. Read the ideas, but also pay careful attention to the surrounding ideas and how they're related together. And secondly, look for the logical connections between ideas. And these are especially seen in the conjunctions. Conjunctions are those words that connect ideas together, such as and, but, because, if, therefore, etc. The old cliche is that whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask what it is there for. That's actually good advice, but it also applies to all of the logical connecting conjunctions. Why are they there? What do they connect and how do they connect them? So look at the fish and notice the logical connections between the ideas. Then the third tool for discourse is to examine the occasion and purpose. Always keep in mind the historical context 
and then discern, especially from the commands, discern what the author was trying to accomplish by writing this discourse. Ask yourself, what would happen in the lives of the readers if they conscientiously read, understood, and obeyed what the author commanded? And then your answer, if correct, will give you the purpose for the discourse. It could be a fireplace, could be a wall, but it could be any number of things. But your job as a reader is to find out what the author intended to accomplish, what they intended to build by the ideas they put together. Now let's briefly discuss some methods to help us read discourse well. Now, in the Advanced Bible Study course, the methods of reading discourse will be greatly elaborated, but let me get you started here. Probably the best tool for understanding discourse is simply to draw the fish. List out the ideas, which of course entails separating them into individual propositions so that you clearly see each thought that the author gives one by one. Then ask, how are these ideas connected? Which entails carefully watching the conjunctions and the way that the author develops the flow of thought. Now, a similar method is to outline the author's argument. Divide it up into the smaller groupings of ideas that are more and more closely related together. And think about the overarching idea that summarizes these smaller groups of related ideas. And show this relatedness in the way that you write it out in an outline form. Now, I realize that all this may be a bit theoretical and abstract. So let me give you a brief example by examining a short discourse passage, which is actually part of a larger passage we don't have time to go into. So let's look at John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And again, for time's sake, I'm going to leave a lot out and we're not going to talk about the connection of the shorter passage to its larger context. But hopefully, this will give you a better sense of how to do this, how to deal with discourse. And hopefully, also, it'll encourage you that this is the kind of thing that I can do for myself. Okay, first, let's separate and list the propositions. First, God so loved the world. Then, second, he gave his one and only Son. Then the one who believes will not perish, but he will have eternal life. Then God did not send the Son to condemn the world. And God sent the Son. This this is clearly implied by the next proposition and the parallel with the preceding two that we'll look back at in a minute. God sent the Son so that the world might be saved through him. Then. Whoever believes is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. And finally, because he has not believed in God's Son. These are the main propositions, the main ideas in this passage. I've left out a few uh, helping words just for illustration's sake. So now we've divided up, we've listed the main ideas. Now let's look carefully at the conjunctions, how they're related together. Now this passage starts with the word for, which connects it to the previous passage, but because we're ignoring the previous passage in this example, we're going to ignore this conjunction. But if we were studying this passage for real, this would be a very important connection to help us understand this passage in the larger literary context. But for now, we'll leave it be. The second proposition is introduced with the word that, which is usually a marker of result, which I'll explain in just a bit. The third proposition also starts with that, which is a marker of result in this case as well. But then the next proposition starts with but, which is a marker of contrast. And then the fifth proposition starts with for, which is often a marker of explanation or elaboration. Now, there's no explicit conjunction connecting the fifth and sixth propositions. But the implied seventh proposition begins with but, 
which again marks a contrast. And then it is connected with the eighth proposition by the phrase, in order that, which is a clear marker of purpose. There's no conjunction introducing the ninth proposition, but the ninth is connected with the tenth by the word but, once again marking a contrast between these two. And then finally, the last proposition in this passage is introduced with the conjunction because, which marks this proposition as the reason for the previous proposition. The reason this person stands condemned is because they did not believe in God's Son. Now, let's try, based on the conjunctions, let's try to describe the relationship between these propositions. First, God gave his only son. That is the result of God loving the world. God loved the world, and because of that, something happened. Something resulted from God's love, and that result was him giving his son. Now, the third and fourth propositions are, are possible outcomes, one being a positive outcome and the next being negative. And both of these outcomes are possible as the result of the two prior propositions. God loved the world. The result is that he gave his, his son. And the result of all that is that we, the one who believes will not perish but have eternal life. Then the sixth proposition is the purpose of the fifth. And the eighth proposition is the purpose of the implied seventh. These two groups work together to emphasize a, a negative purpose, why God did not send the Son, followed by a positive purpose, why he did send the Son. His purpose was in sending the Son was not this. That was not his purpose, but it was this. See the contrast? and both of those giving the purpose. Then the ninth and tenth propositions are also a positive and negative contrast, emphasizing the two possible opposite outcomes. And then, as we mentioned, the last proposition gives the reason for the preceding possible negative outcome. Now, let's try to group all these propositions together to form a tentative outline of this passage. The first two propositions are the main idea of the passage. God loved the world, and the result is that he gave his son. And then the result of the sending is that there are two and only two possible outcomes, to perish or to have eternal life. And the choice of these outcomes depends on whether a person believes in the son whom God sent. Then the next four propositions are an explanation an elaboration of the first four. That is, they explain the purpose, why God sent the Son, and, and it links it closely with the two possible outcomes. The bad outcome, no, that's not why he sent it. Or the good outcome, yes, that was God's purpose in sending the Son. Of course, a contrast between the good possibility and the bad possibility. Then the last three propositions highlight the implication of everything that went before, and, and therefore it strongly points to the application for the readers. Because of all this, there are two alternate destinies that are a possibility for every reader. One of these is great, the other is horrible. And the difference between these two destinies is believing in God's Son, whom he sent so that we might be saved. Therefore, we're clearly encouraged to believe in the Son and to find life in Him. Now, of course, there's very much more in this passage that could be described, but I hope this has given you a decent example of how you can profitably read discourse by looking at the typical characteristics using the tools and the methods we've discussed. Speaking of the characteristics, tools, and methods, let's review. The character of discourse is that it is ideas working together for a purpose. The tools for reading discourse are context, connecting conjunctions, and commands. And the methods for reading discourse 
are drawing the fish and outlining the argument. Hopefully, you now have a decent introductory understanding of discourse. Like I mentioned, in Advanced Bible Study course, this will be elaborated in much more detail. But in the next section of this course, we're going to look at an introduction to reading narratives. Thanks for watching.